So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Patricia Greenberg. You're on, Good kid. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much for both for Laura and Harry for the introduction. That was very kind. I'm so grateful to be here and thankful that you all are here as well to uh, join me on this. Um, I'm a at home um, leader training. Um, and indeed, I'm going to be going through this presentation as if it were as if you were all um, new I'm a site leaders. And so basically, um, I, I did modify it a little bit because I'm a site leaders must also manage volunteers and that is a tough job and so um that i will skip and you will just see the presentation mainly about removing invasive species so i need to go back out a second please there we go I believe okay we're good to go. Do you see my screen? All right, great. And um, there might be site, existing IMA site leaders here as well. So hopefully this is a good review, if not, not too boring for you um, as we go through this again. Uh, so uh, thank you again for inviting me to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing this information because I think if we can all be part of uh, removing invasive species that we see around our home, we can make a great impact. Uh, and so I'm really quickly going to go tell you what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to do a quick introduction that I think Harry's already done that for me. And so I'll probably skip through that really quickly. Uh, tell you a little bit about the natural resource management and protection branch with the Fairfax County Park Authority. We'll talk about what the problem is with invasive species, um, how to identify them, how to properly remove them. Um, and oops. Oops, oops, oops. Um, oh, now I have a pointer. Thank you. Um, and let's see. Um, and then how to um, manage volunteers because there is a new IMA site leader who is here joining us today. So he's in his training. So I will go briefly over how we do volunteer management. Um, and then talk about the show a little bit of before and after successes and um, Talk about planting natives, so I think that would be a whole other presentation. So I um, wanted to give a little bit of information about my experience in natural resource management. My training in school is really um, environmental science and policy and uh, mostly in like the policy stance. And so my work um, in natural resources and my knowledge with invasive species really came from working with Claudia Thompson Deal. Hi, Claudia. Um, at Reston Association and uh, of course on the ground with the Peace Corps um, and working with farmers out there. But a lot of the work has been on the ground with Reston managing wildlife, human, human wildlife conflict, supporting um, beavers um, in our wetland in Reston, as well as managing trails and uh, uh, removing invasive species. And as I went, I can, um, you know, did a lot of work with just um, meeting people out on the ground who perhaps had encroached on our open space and then would provide some education to um, to the homeowners about removing invasive species uh, to around their home as well. So, and planting natives to support wildlife. <clears throat> of course, there came a lot of, um, um issues can i see oh well here you go a little virginia bluebell surrounded with english ivy so a lot of the time i spent was looking at these things and trying to figure out best ways to manage that i incorporated uh, fairfax county's non-native invasive assessment protocol um, for rest and associations prioritization system as well and learned about how we can manage our healthiest parcels um, and prioritize those to protect and reduce the um, encroachment of invasive species and also managing wet um, meadows. Um, and that's something over here you can see at um, Eleanor C. Lawrence Park has some beautiful meadows and um, as well as in Reston. So managing those is a lot of where I got my experience in natural resource management. 
Okay, so really quickly, the Fairfax County Park Authority strives to inspire and sustain a passion for parks and leisure experiences that enhances our community's quality of life. And that is what I'm a site leaders help us do. So the resource management protection branch um, does a lot of things for the park authority. We educate and engage the public. We do a lot of research, a lot of um, get information gathering, for instance, on deer browse, <clears throat> bat populations, to give you an example. We review plans, any plans that are coming through that might be close to park authority land. We're reviewing them for impacts and providing recommendations. Uh, we conduct field work. So we have a team that is out there doing ecological restoration to help restore open space and provide diversity of habitat. Uh, we, we monitor and manage those resources and then we provide recreational opportunities as well. And our IMA site leaders in their volunteering help us do all of these things as well. There we go. So when people come to us to, to want to remove invasive species from their property, we have them go through quite a list of steps to become an IMA site leader. Uh, and to do that, one thing is to attend existing IMA site volunteer events. Uh, and unfortunately, I do have to put this as a, a side note, is that currently we have placed a cap on our IMA site leaders just temporarily. We're at 90 site leaders or over um, and over 65 sites. And for two people who are in my team for managing IMA um, to be able to support everybody properly, we feel that we can no longer take on new site leaders because it, we wouldn't be able to provide all the resources and support that they would need. And so temporarily, we're, we're not doing this, but this is a great opportunity to, to train people to do it on their own property because that will help reduce invasives in, in parkland as well. You're removing the seed source, right? Um, so 96% of our staff, people who help us with managing our natural resources on parkland are actually our volunteers. Um, we have over 3,000 volunteers, resource management volunteers a year that come out and sign up for invasive um, polls through the IMA site leaders. So what IMA site leaders will do is send us their date and their location of park and when they're gonna be working. And we have a calendar that you can access online. Uh, if you were to Google Fairfax County and then IMA, IMA, you will find that calendar and you can see all the variety of locations where you can work throughout the um, Fairfax County um, and volunteer there. So really, um, our volunteers are the cream of the crop, the IMA volunteers, because they are the ones that really help us to do the work out there. We could not do the invasive management without uh, the volunteers. <clears throat> Let me back up one second. Um, because our staff, we, this team, the IMA volunteer, the IMA um, program also has a budget for managing invasive species through a contractor throughout the 24,000 acres of parkland. And so to be able to manage all of that 24,000 acres, we, would, we do not have enough budget. So we really do depend on our volunteers. So why do we remove invasive species, right? Why is this so important? And what I like to talk about and try to, um, I was made aware by a very close family friend recently that it really just does depend on how you approach this topic. Uh, she has worked with refugee and immigration rights for many years. And so for her to hear invasive or non-native um, is, is offensive, it didn't fit. And so I wanna be able to share information. And this is something that we talk with our IMA site leaders about is being able to share the information with the public. When you're out there pulling and your neighbor walks by, you wanna be able to say, well, why am I doing this? This is so important. What are you doing? What are you taking out? Why isn't that beautiful? Why would you wanna remove that? This is why I wanna remove it. I want to provide habitat. I want to provide a food source for for songbirds and for other wildlife, like the little box turtle. If you see that little box turtle hidden on the left top, um, and by removing invasive species, we're allowing native species to thrive. And so, why is this important? Don't invasive species provide food for wildlife? Right? Isn't that why we plant? Um, butterfly bush, right? Because it's great for butterflies. They love coming out there. And yes, this is true. They do love the nectar, but what natives do, native um, 
um, plants do is that they provide a food source and habitat for all three seasons, right? And so that's something you can explain, something um, that Doug Talame made a really good point on in his book, Bringing Nature Home, was how that, that our native species provide more food source for our native critters than our invasive species. For instance, caterpillars for the babies of our, of our songbirds. And then of course, invasive species are linked to the decline of our songbird population because one, well, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but our invasive species are the first to leaf out. And so they're the first to provide cover for our um, nesting birds. And then the birds feel they're safe in this little uh, bush honeysuckle, but they're easy prey for predators too low, um, not the right type of habitat for them. So when you're out in your yard, you know, uh, you really have to have an eye, you know, not all, all not all green is good. And um, you, you have to be able to spot these things within, within the green, the mass of green in your landscape. And so perhaps you can already see the little frog hidden on the left and the stick, the stick, um, walking stick here on the right. And then again, you know, not all green is good. So we're looking at this habitat as we walk by taking a trail and we see the green and we might say, oh, well, this is good. But what we're seeing here is most likely Japanese honeysuckle vine on the ground. This is early, early spring. You see the trees aren't leafed out. Bush honeysuckle, like I said, the first first of the, of the green to leaf out in spring. So a lot of times what I'll tell people as we're walking through in the early spring is you, you're, everything you're seeing that's this lime green color, if you're out in the early spring, uh, are non-native species. So it's pretty amazing once you start to see the invasives, you'll never see the forest the same again. Um, and then just 50 yards down from that same patch, you have a much uh, different habitat. Uh, there's no trail running through it. So what we see with trails is that trails are your introduction of invasive species, of, of disturbance. And so where you have disturbed soil, you will most likely have invasive species. They take advantage of disturbed soils. Um, and then also, if you noticed, I can go back one again, the size of the trees, mostly what you see here are small, all about the same size. And here you see a lot more diversity in species, a lot less invasives um, on the ground. So which looks healthier to you? You know, some people might say, well, the, well, the area where you have more plants, where it's green, that looks healthier. But in fact, that th because the majority of those plants growing there are non-native, it, it is not providing the same habitat. On the right, you have some young, very young seedlings coming up. Um, so the diversity that's there, and perhaps since this is just winter, you're not really seeing the native grasses and other things that might be coming up or spring beauties that will come up later in the spring. And how about here? Are you seeing, you know, which is healthier to you? You know, we're seeing here on the left, nice, um, nice growth and diversity of trees, some young seedlings down at the bottom. On the right, you have a monoculture of English ivy and English ivy on the trees. So I would say the one on the left to me is healthier. So where are we looking for invasive species? You know, we want to look towards the edge. A lot of times it's the wood edge where you're seeing a lot of the invasive species. That's where the deep, the, the, um, where you get the most sun. You're looking again for areas of disturbance. Uh, if there had been a previous, um, you know, a construction site or um, trail going through an area, uh, you'll, you'll see that that is where you're going to be looking for, you'll be finding your invasive species. Um, looking for green in the winter. A lot of the green we see in the winter is not native. Look for abundance and monoculture. So looking, and I'll give you some examples of these, but a lot of times when we're, look, we're seeing invasive species, you're seeing the same species really dense in an area um, and over and over again, or big patches of it. You know, you have one large burning bush and underneath it is the, the shadow of all the babies that are coming up. Uh, so really quickly, you know, here's the, here's the edge of the trail where you have your bush honeysuckle at the top right, and you can see it's really early spring because at the top right corner uh, is a redbud um, just flowering there. 
uh, and this is a great example of where you'd see the, you know, the, the nesting birds start to place their nest in these low bush honeysuckle, uh, feeling that they're protected, feeling that they're, um, they're, you know, cut under cover. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're not as safe as they could be if they were in a native shrub or tree. Uh, and then you have along also the, the a wood edge, the mass as, of, of multi-floor rose vines or blackberry that just take over an area. Um, you know, perhaps people walking dogs or dogs go in this mass and then walk out with still grass seeds on them. So this is how it continues to spread throughout the edge habitat. So here's some examples of disturbance, landscape beds nearby, um, construction sites again, anybody doing agriculture or had had done agriculture at Eleanor C. Lawrence Park where I worked that had all been agricultural fields and you know, then allowed um, by Eleanor to, to grow up and become a forested habitat again, but in that understory, it was just solid invasive species because that soil was uh, disturbed it's easy for invasives to take advantage of that space. <clears throat> so we've done a lot of work with volunteers to try to restore that habitat. And then of course, water, you know, our, with crazy storms we've been getting, the water's really starting to wash down invasives or in that riparian zone in throughout Fairfax County. That is where we have uh, the majority of our invasive species are through that riparian zone, um, the stream banks where they carry the garlic mustard and still grass seeds throughout so again, looking for green in the winter, I have a couple examples here of what you might be seeing. Pachysandra, Japanese pachysandra, very typical. That's a tough plant, tough plant to kill whether um, pulling it out or tough plant to kill with using herbicides too. On the left um, bottom corner, I have yellow archangel, another very popular ground cover. That's a very typical invasive species that we see throughout our woods and, and it also stays green in the winter. And then lesser salandine, you see one of the things we're looking for, right, is the abundance of, an, of a species. And this is one that within the past few years, it has really dominated our open space. Um, and you can see the leaf shape. There are There is a native <clears throat> salandine um, in our wetland. Um, but if you look at the um, the furthest right photo, you can see the leaf shape down at the bottom. This one, I just I wanted to show this photo because it's just so sad where the salandine is when with the spring beauties and the trout lily, and that is one of the things that we see in our in our um, along our streams in Fairfax County. And it's been a big struggle to try to prioritize sites to remove invasives like salandine, where this specific species has tiny little bulbets. They're just minuscule little bulbets and they are so compact together that you can see in the middle photo, it will become a carpet of invasive, of, of invasive celandine and, and just solid and it will suffocate out the native species. And I remember just recently reading uh, an email that came through the Mid-Atlantic Invasive Plant Council that, you know, one side of Rock Creek Park uh, in Maryland, uh, there not treating the lesser celandine and on the other side of the creek in Washington DC they are treating the lesser celandine and on the side where they're treating the lesser celandine because the thing with celandine is that it's really hard to dig out um, you you it's hard to get all the ball bets and you basically have to dig out all the soil um, and so it, it's near impossible so you must use herbicide in this situation um, to manage them but on the side where they are treating it in Rock Creek, uh, along Rock Creek Park, you are seeing wildflowers and a huge diversity of, ha you know, of species there. While on the Maryland side where they're not treating it, unfortunately, it's all lesser celandine. So things that we're looking for, monocultures, right? The plant that ate the south, kudzu. Um, you're looking for one species dominating over another and over, over everything. Um, then, of course, the impacts of our invasive species um, impact to our, the system resilience, um, a loss of our system function, a loss of diversity. We understand what loss of diversity means. What about our system resilience? Let's see what we're talking about here is where you have um, trees covered in kudzu perhaps or trees covered in oriental bittersweet vines or um, porcelain berry vines and the vines are just so heavy that the tree if a storm were to come one of our typical strings 
spring storms, that tree would have less of ability to withstand a strong whipping wind uh, with the weight of those vines on top of it. While as, you know, if they did not have those vines or those English ivy vines around their, their roots system, um, it would have a better chance of survival. So, you know, this training isn't to have you learn every single invasive species. The idea here is for you to learn the most common invasive species so that you can see them in your yard and you know how to properly remove them. And then, of course, restore that habitat. Give me one second. I want to make sure I'm not missing something here. So here are a quick view of our priority species that we're seeing out there. Of course, more and more come daily. And, and it really does depend on your, your area where you live. There's some re, what we call a more regional invasive species where you have a Japanese maple tree, you know, and then you see it invading the, the forest near your home um, or on your property. <clears throat> so Japanese still grass. This one came in like a tsunami through the east coast a few years ago and really just um, started to take over um, lawns um, and forested areas it really just hides away our um, understory native species struggle it really reduces um, diversity in our in our areas uh, and the thing with stilt grass is that it is just it's a grass and so trying to control it is really hard but it can be done i visited a park on, and i'm a site leader who's been doing it for eight years uh, called arrowhead park um, not too far from um, it, out in centerville and he has been pulling with volunteers stilt grass for eight years and the diversity of wildflowers along the trail system was phenomenal and i said that is what the difference is if somebody will just spend a little bit of time to remove that stilt grass it really does make a difference but it's feeling like you can do it. It can be pretty um, uh, daunting to see a field like this one and um, and feel like you can make a difference. Uh, the seed bank is long. It, you you have um, you know seven to ten years once a grass goes to seed um, that the seeds will be there. So just repeat you know every year, spend some time removing it. And if it is a field of it. What you can do is prioritize it by saying there isn't an, a nice native species. I'm going to work on this area because I want to give these natives a chance to grow. You see some wildflowers. This is where you're going to pull it and just keep it away from this area. If it is, if that's the least that you can do ideally. So there is a native grass that looks similar. And so at the top right corner, you have a nice close up photo of the blades of the grass. And here you can see that there is a vein down the middle. It's just off center. And if you were to take that blade of grass and sort of move it, you can see that that center um, vein is a little shinier. So um, that's one way of telling that still that is still grass and not the native. And also still grass, because the way it's called still, the roots are very shallow. They're really easy just to pull and remove. It should come up really easily. So if you're removing it within native grasses, let's say you've already spread grass seed for native species or you have um, natives that you want to protect, a lot of times you can just really lightly grab that still grass and the still grass will give while as the natives will you know, be harder to pull. And so that's when you want to let go a little bit. And so that you're not pulling up the good stuff too. <clears throat> Another technique for removal here is to allow it to come up and then in July, mid-July before it seeds, that's when you want to cut it down. Um, bush hog it, mow it, string trim it, whatever works, but cutting it down just before it seeds, um, most likely it will not it will not it will not regrow i know that because you've it's spent out all its energy but many times that seed bank may regerminate once it gets that fresh sunlight and i've added a, a little map here in the middle of the slide to show you how the invasives have spread or where they're spreading to and um there's a couple of them where it shows you how it used to be back in 2008 when these slides were first originally made and then what the, what it looks like now Autumn olive, uh, this was a plant you know, installed many, many years ago, brought over as a you know, great food source, great for erosion control, just as kudzu was. And then lo and behold, it became an incredibly invasive species. It's a big problem in agricultural fields. Uh, easy to identify because the bottom of the leaf is silver. So it has this sort of silver 
um, tint to the bottom. The top is um, a darker green. The bottom is a silvery green. And then also um, the branches. So like in the winter, if you're not, if you're working out there in the winter, the little tips of the branches are very light colored. And if you look closely, they look spray painted on like a little silvery spray paint on the, on the, on the little um, branches there. Um, bright red berries, they are edible. People make jams out of them. The birds love to eat them, um, just like the berries of the bush honeysuckle and the burning bush. But what uh, the recent studies have shown is that these these berries of the non-native species are like junk food for birds. They don't provide the same nutrients that they need to make their migration. Um, and so another linkage to invasive species and uh, the um, decline of the songbird population. So here is the English ivy. Um, I think this one is pretty easy to identify. You can see at the bottom, the different leaf shapes. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of what it looks like when it's a mature leaf and a juvenile leaf down on the ground, the mature leaf you see a lot when it's climbing up something, when it's about to send out its seeds, like you see here at the top. Um, and uh, really important with English ivy when it, it is on and around the base of your trees, it is holding a lot of moisture. It is, um, so it's a great place for, this is stuff you can share with your neighbors or your volunteers. They, they harbor mosquitoes. It's a nice dark place for mosquitoes to go and hide in. Um, the moisture doesn't dissipate easily from the root system of your trees. And so it starts to rot the, the roots. It starts to rot the bark of the tree where you have these really dense vines on the bark of your trees. Um, the, it, the, it, it um, declines the health of your tree. It causes a decline in the health of your tree because of this weight on the bark, on the branches, um, because of the moisture in the root system and on the bark, and many times trees will just topple over. So always bag your English ivy cuttings. This is ideal because the roots, um, the even some of the stems can re-root if they're washed away. So um, ideally you're bagging your English ivy. And I have a slide about bagging now that we have a new policy in Fairfax County on um, using paper bags for yard debris. However, invasive species should still be bagged in trash bags. You just wouldn't need to put a sign on your bag for while your contractors and trash companies are getting used to doing this. So technique for English ivy, you know, ideally what you're doing is you're creating a ring, a donut around the base of your tree and um, cutting the vines, you're making a window, right? And this goes for all invasive vines. What you're trying to do is create a window, right? You cut low and you pull out the vines that you can from the ground and then you cut high and you take out that middle section <clears throat> but you don't want to remove the rest of the vines above on the tree because the tree may already be in decline and so um, you might pull the tree down on top of you you don't want to do that or it might pull the bark off the tree itself and then that that would not be healthy for the tree so cut low pull those vines out of the ground cut high and remove that space because then what you're also doing is you're reducing the chance for other vines to climb up and have something easily to grab onto to then go back up again garlic mustard i'm sure some of you have seen this or are very familiar with garlic mustard here's one of my d comparison maps right there of what it used to be like and what it's like now that's pretty drastic <laughs> change. Um, so uh, garlic mustard is pretty easy to identify at this time of the year. It's got that little cluster of small white flowers at the top. Some of them have already started to send out the seeds um, there. And um, so you will see like the little tiny seed pods, little needle thin seeds, and you'll see those out in the woods. And easy to remove if you're not sure, you would want to um, take a leaf and crush it up in your hand and has that garlicky smell to it. It is, um, uh, has a two year cycle. So the first year is gonna have this basil leaf down low to the ground. And the second year it's gonna bolt up to produce the flowers and the seeds. Uh, and this um, invasive species is linked to the decline, or it's linked to the possible extinction of the West Virginia white butterfly, where the West Virginia white butterfly lays its eggs on the native mustard um, species, and but does not cannot tell the difference between the two. So it lays its eggs on the garlic mustard, and the eggs caterpillars, you know, come out and have nothing to eat. 
It also has an allopathic chemical. It's a chemical that alters the soil chemistry, um, inhibiting other plants from growing there. And so it, um, ideally what you're doing is also bagging this invasive or pulling it, placing it, I've had to place it like in the middle of a trail that I'm walking on <laughs> or on a trunk of a tree, um, just trying to remove it from the soil. And one plant can grow, you know, produce over a thousand seeds. It's just phenomenal. Multiflow rose, uh, such a dominating invasive species throughout our open space. You can see the map at the bottom um, left there. Uh, there is a native Carolina rose, so I always like to check and make sure um, that I'm pointing out the right invasive or the right uh, rose. And the main difference that you're looking for is right here on the leaf of the multiflora rose. They have leaflets, um, and this is one leaf, is that st small stem there, has these sheaths, and on the sheaths got little tiny hairs. The native rose has a very smooth sheath with the one um, end. So the non-native has these little hairs, that's what you want to check on, um, and the native has a smooth sheath that comes off the leaf. And multifloros, as you can see here at the top photo, middle photo, it can grow very tall. It's amazing how you will just see it, you know, 20 feet up over on a tree. And you're like, that's multifloros. How did it even get up there? Um, and so looking for it up in trees, following those stems down, cutting them, um, creating that window again and then digging those roots out is really important. Multiflow rows, if you cannot dig those roots out, if that's just not something in your wheelhouse, you can keep cutting it, keep cutting it every year, just keep it down. The deer will eat it, deer, deer will munch on it. Um, and though it may take years and years and years to ever deplete that, the life of the multiflow rows, that is just one way of keeping it from taking over an area. Um, but ideally, you are uh, using a weed wrench or a shovel um, and digging those roots out. We have one imacite leader who loves removing, uh, her name is Heidi Allen. She loves removing multiflow rows and has even trained her dog. She'll tie a rope around the root and has her dog help her pull it out. It's pretty amazing. Japanese barberry. Okay, a typical landscape plant. I'm sure you've seen it everywhere. It's sold everywhere. It's great because it's got its thorns on it, so it keeps people out of areas where they don't want people walking through. Um, it produces these red berries. Unfortunately, it's linked with the increase of Lyme disease. Um, it's just a place where the little field mice can hide under, um, and it harbors the desert ticks there. Uh, the leaves are easy to identify because they have this sort of spoon shape to them, and um, the, the stems also uh, are easy to identify. You can see here they have this sort of stripy reddish tint to them. So that's one way to look for it. Um, and let's see. I think I have. Um, it can, they, they, the roots also are bright neon yellow. Um, so that's kind of cool to see when you're digging it out. They're pretty shallow rooted. So ideally what you're doing is cutting it back, cutting it back, taking a lopper you know, cutting back the thorny branches, getting them out of your way, and then getting under there, under the ground, and digging out those roots, because it will just regrow. All these invasive species, if you're not digging those roots out, they'll just re-sprout on you. Oh, here's another close-up of the leaf shape here, spoon shape, um, just to give you an idea what you're looking for. A lot of times I'm seeing, what stands out to me is the bark. The bark in the woods in the winter time, a lot of times we're out there working in the winter, uh, <clears throat> or is that stripy bark, that stripy red bark helps me identify it. And of course these little thorns, and a lot of times in the winter these red berries are stuck on those branches, it makes it easy to see. So then we have the uh, bush honeysuckle. Really, I think in Reston, this was like the dominant species. This was the number one. And I put a picture here of the bark because in the woods, that's what you're really looking for in the middle of winter um, is that stripy bark. It really stands out. It's a very light colored um, bark as well. It's a little bit more khaki yellowy color than our native species. Right now, it's got those lovely smelling white honeysuckle flowers um, and soon to have those red berries. Again, junk food for birds. Um, the the leaves come out opposite 
one another um, and have that sort of narrowed tip to them. Um, but it's a really brittle bush. I've seen it so many times as people's like landscape bushes or small trees, unfortunately. Uh, but this is also one that's been around for a very, very long time. The roots are really shallow. However, when you have a bush honeysuckle that is just really massive, it's really hard to um, dig out. Um, Though the roots are, like I said, are very shallow. So using a weed wrench or a shovel, you can get that the trunk loosened up. Um, ideally, you're cutting those branches out of your way. Um, unless it's small, some of the small ones you can just easily pull up because the roots are very shallow. Winged burning bush, another typical landscape plant that you see all over with that beautiful fuchsia color. People just love it. And then here you have a great image of how the invasive has spread throughout the United States from 2008 to 2021. Uh, there is a native Euonymus, and so I like to point out uh, that um, the Euonymus americana is hearts bursting with love and or uh, strawberry bush is another name for them, a great native, though a lot of times you don't see it so nice and tall like you do the burning bush because the deer also eat it. The stems of the burning bush are stripy with green, you know, green, and then also have a little bit of stripiness to them. You see in the winter at the bottom left, you can see the red leaves as well as the green bark. However, um, the non-native, so the Yuana Miscellata, the non-native, the winged burning bush has more of a stripy bark where you see like yellowy and green and reds in the bark. Um, and the native Yuana Miss, just to, to be careful if you're looking for this one out and about, the native is a lot more delicate, dark green color all throughout um, the stem. You see sometimes on the larger bushes, you'll see a little bit of stripiness, but it's mostly just a green um, and very delicate looking. The leaves are slightly similar, um, also produces red berries. The roots of the burning bush are also very shallow, so easy to dig up with a weed wrench or a shovel. Um, when they're also very large, like I was going to say with the burning bush or the bush honeysuckle, when the when the shrubs are very large, that's a really tough one to dig out. And what we do for our IMA site leaders or what we're offering for our IMA site leaders is that if there are multiple of these large bushes or really huge vines that they cannot dig out or volunteers cannot dig out, what we have to do is come through during the winter or the fall and do a cut stump treatment with a high concentration of herbicide. We cut the stump and then we have a really cool tool which you can find online called the buckthorn blaster. And the buckthorn blaster we put in a high concentration about 20 to 24 percent uh, of the herbicide, whether it's uh, glyphosate or triclopyr, and then apply that directly. It's like a, it's a little bottle with a sponge tip on it. It makes it very, very clean, and you're just applying a herbicide to the stump of the bush at a fresh cut. You want to cut fresh and then apply the herbicide to that, and then that herbicide is absorbed into the root system and kills the plant that way. And so if you are removing multiple massive shrubs, and um, roots that the vines just cannot be dug out. That is something that um, I, we would recommend to be to keep it from taking over again. And so here's a, a couple examples of the of the tools that we use for removing multi-floor rows or bushes like um, burning bush and bush honeysuckle. You have the weed wrench or these days called the puller bear. It's a root puller. It has a, a wrench mechanism where it grabs onto the base of the trunk. It's really ideal for removing bushes. It pull, it grabs that base of the trunk and removes those roots out of the ground. It's so satisfying. People love using this tool in the woods. Um, it is just Oops, you can really see um, a big impact um, when you remove those um, invasives. And what you're ideally what we want you to do is you're removing those root systems. You're asking volunteers or you do it yourself, shake those roots out, put that soil back into the ground, tamp that soil back down, cover it up with leaves or um, whatever material you might have around you um, so that you're reducing that disturbed soil because a lot of times what's going to happen is you remove one invasive, another invasive might come back come back into that space. Um, and so if you can reduce the area, um, definitely not leaving bare soil. Uh, ideally, you are always keeping your soil covered um, with leaves or getting some mulch or something like that. Soil likes to be covered. It does not like to be bare. Um, 
because then you might be inviting some more invasives there. So I'm going to get into the vines a little bit. This is winter creeper, a very typical landscape plant. Um, top left corner here, you can see the white vines along the leaves. That's one way to identify them. Um, it has it does produce these white and reddish berries. Um, also a euonymus species. Um, pretty easy to remove, pretty easy to dig up. You can get some very, very big vines climbing up trees, but another one that is easy to dig up, um, but keeping an eye out for this one is key because it does spread by those berries, um, and so you'll find it in random places. So this is one to keep an eye out for. Just becomes a monoculture on the ground. Mile a minute. Uh, this one's just starting to come up. It's got that equilateral triangle leaf. Um, easy to see. It's got these little purpley blue berries. Um, easy to remove, though it has these thorns. Um, it's sort of like a catch and keep. It like, scrapes your, your skin. So ideally you're wearing gloves and long sleeves uh, to remove it. It can get pretty tall and high up on the trees. It, what it does is just covering, it has a smothering growth. Um, in the past years, with support of VDAX, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, we have um, used a weevil. It's a biocontrol, a little uh, weevil, to try to suppress myelominate. It does not kill myelominate, but it does reduce the growth. So you can see this bottom left corner is kind of, it's an old photo, you know, we got some old style clothing here. Um, and uh, so what people have noticed more than anything is that you do not see that mile a minute way up high in the trees any longer. You're mostly seeing it lower um, and keeping, it keeps it lower down to the ground. And so um, it eats the berries, it sort of suppresses that new growth and that's really what it does. So we still need help to remove this invasive species. Horseland berry, oh my gosh, I think since starting to work for the Park Authority, I have noticed how this one has is just really all over our county and something to keep an eye out for. It, it can look a lot like grapevine. And so I have a photo here in the middle to help us understand what the vine looks like in comparison to our wild grape or even the Virginia creeper. Um, it's got very deeply lobed leaves. However, um, so, do, so do some of our grapes. And so um, the one way to tell is now with the clusters of flowers, they're at the top of your vine. They're above the vine and they're sort of like this, like a little cluster of flowers above the vine, whereas our grapes, of course, they hang down like uh, the grapes you see in the store. Um, so looking for that as one of the, your, your indicators of the porcelain berry vine. Um, in the middle here you can see is the porcelain berry vine. Um, and let's see if I can get my little marker here. So this is your porcelain berry vine. What you're looking for is the pith the center part of the vine if you are not sure if you've got a grape or if you've got a porcelain berry what you can do is take a small vine and just clip it so that you can see the center part of that vine the if it is white it is the porcelain berry if it has a brown pith center brown center point then it is going to be the um it is going to be your native grape. Uh, and so a lot of times what we say is if you have, you know, native grapes or Virginia creeper within your mass of porcelain berry or orient bittersweet, there's going to be a martyr, right? The natives might have to be cut while you get uh, your invasive species under control. We're not looking to um, remove grape vines or Virginia creeper vines. And so I do like to train that you know, our volunteers to know the difference because we do want to promote our native vines. They are a great food source for our wildlife. Um, but porcelain berry becomes so dominating and just takes over areas like you can see on this bottom folder photo. It is just smothering growth. It will kill trees. Um, and so for, for the time to get that stuff under control, dig out those roots, um, you might have to be also accidentally or on purpose taking out some of the native vines to, to be able to manage the invasives. So that's your key is your white pith for the porcelain berry um, and the clusters of the flower or flowers and berries at the top clustering above the vine. I'm looking for that. They are so beautiful, aren't they? Those colors are just a beautiful. People love it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an unfortunate one. Uh, something to explain is, is what it does is just smother growth. And, you know, one conversation that I've had really 
quite often more recently is how uh, grapevines can also seem to be very aggressive this way. And yes, I think along wood edges, uh, the grapevine can become rather aggressive on our trees. So if you have like a young tree uh, or trees that you're trying to allow, you know, to grow, you might want to there in those cases, I would say, yeah, you probably want to cut out some of that grapevine to allow that native tree to grow. However, in the woods where you have a nice healthy grape growing up with the trees, and that's what grapes do, they don't smother in a sense, or they don't strangle, I should say, the tree, it grows up with it, it coexists with our native trees. And so it, deep in the woods, you have this massive grape growing with the tree, and it's not harming the tree at all. Um, and so that is where we want to um, give them a chance. I know I'm going rather quickly through everything. So if there's any questions in the end, I'll be happy to go back to these slides. Oriental bittersweet um, has some monstrous vines. Some of those vines are larger than my thighs, my legs, <laughs> they're just big. Um, easy to identify because of the shape of its leaf, oval shaped leaf with that point to them. They have some undulations, some waviness to the edges of those leaves. Those vines will corkscrew around trees. And so watching out for vines that are coiling themselves or corkscrewing around other trees or other vines, you know that that is most likely a non-native. Our native vines don't tend to do that at all. They just kind of hang with um, the trees and grow up with them. Um, so you can have these really dense, um, you know, smothering vines over top of bushes and over top of trees, and you don't even know what's under there until you remove those vines. So cutting those vines out, creating that window again is really key. Um, cutting low, cutting high. Some of the vines are just so large, you won't be able to dig them out, but the smaller vines can be pretty easily dug out. You can pull them out, they can be shallow, and so they have a bright orange color to them. Uh, there is a native bittersweet that I've never seen in the wild, but always, you know, looking out for it. They say they do hybridize the native Bittersweet has cluster has the cluster of vine of berries down only at the tip of the branch, while as our non-native has the berries all along the stem. So you'll see it all along the the stems or the vines, and that's the non-native. And they have a beautiful color originally brought over as a wreath, you know, a holiday wreath with that red and that yellow color. Somebody tossed it in their woods somewhere and then boom, all the, all the berries spread. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, the young vines can look like little tree seedlings in the woods. Sometimes they have lenticels, which are the little dots on the vines um, that helps you identify that. Um, but the way it's coiling around things and is really your indicator. Here's your pachysandra again, uh, dense monoculture, really hard to dig out. Those, those roots will just break on you, but it is possible. There's an imacite leader over at Difficult Run who's done an incredible job where it was just solid monoculture like this bottom photo. Solid Solid has worked with volunteers, you know, repeated weekend after weekend and have really cleared out um, a forested area of this pachysandra. It's phenomenal. Um, now it just needs to get the homeowner to be on board you know, to remove it as well. Um, but this one is a slow creeper, it, but it just does become a web of vines underground. And so making sure you're digging it out and carefully bagging it to get it out of there. So again, here's a little quick example, just a reminder, you know, cut, pull those roots out, um, making sure you're getting that root out, covering that soil, tamping it down so you don't have exposed um, loose soil so we don't create an erosion problem. Um, making that window, you know, when you're removing those vines, really important. Here we go, bag up your invasive species. Um, it's really important that we um, don't allow the spread of these. Uh, a lot of the, what happens with the yard waste is that it goes to a mulched area. It gets mulched down, it gets turned, it's used then again um, by landscapers. They buy, they get their mulch from there, it's free. Um, they can use that in landscape beds. And so some of these invasive species, a tiny little piece of root will reroot in the ground. And so then we're spreading more invasive species. So um, it's really important that we make sure we bag it and it goes into the incinerator. And so one I'm a site leader made this temporary sign because the um, 
trash company was like, we, you know, we can't take these. Um, and so placing a temporary sign like this, um, so that your lands, your, uh, contractor knows that this is not landscape waste. It is trash. And I really want, I wanted to go over quickly, you know, things to keep an eye on out there are, you know, our early detection rapid response plants. So uh, a new one at the bottom right here is Cordalis and Sisa. Uh, I think it's a nice little landscape plant people might have bought, but it just is an incredible spreader. Um, the photo is hard to tell, but this is just solid Cordalis out in difficult run. Um, so it's a new one for us and relatively new just to managing it and figuring out our contractors haven't had to manage it. They've dealt with it a lot for a lot longer time in, um, in New York. And so we're working with them to gather some information for managing it um, along with our lesser celandine. It's an early spring plant. So we don't want it in our woods because it does take up the space of our spring ephemerals. Um, at the bottom right, something to keep an eye out for is the wavy leaf basket grass. Perhaps you're already familiar with this, but this is a low growing vine, creeps along the, the, the surface, serious wavy leaf. Um, so that is your clear indicator. Uh, it grows in the shade. It doesn't like the sun. Um, there is an invasive grass that likes to grow in the sun, anthracnose. I think it anthracnose is what it's called. Um, and so that's the biggest difference is these are in the shade and they are very flat. Anthracnose is higher growing straight up. Um, and so you're looking for this and easy to dig up, easy to pull up, easy to plant to pull. Um, the, the seeds are sticky. Um, so once it's going into seed in July, just keeping an eye out. So you're, when you're walking through the woods, keep an eye out for this guy. Um, the seed stem just like stick straight up and they're like spiky little seeds and they'll stick to your clothes stick to your dog's paws and then like a couple hours later just fall off um, if you don't already the maiden app mid-atlantic early detection network is a great app for helping to log invasive species that you might be seeing out in the woods if you're taking a hike um, some of the typical ones you know we probably already know are out there but some of these new ones um, we'd love your help with logging it and maiden um, iNaturalist is another way um, this maiden app is through the early detection distribution mapping system um, with university of georgia and so they're working on tying iNaturalist to their uh, mapping system so that we all know where our invasives are since a lot of people like to use iNaturalist and we'll also log invasives in there as well um, so when you are working out there, you just wanted to put this up there, uh, protecting yourselves, your volunteers from uh, poison ivy, you know, hairy reddish vines, uh, leaves a three shiny, shiny uh, leaf. That's the oil. I always tell volunteers, you know, you got three hours by the time you touch that leaf to wash off. And if you know, and you're out in the woods and you've, you've touched that poison ivy, you can just grab a little bit of soil, like a little bit of soil from the trail somewhere, rub it on your skin if you don't have like rubbing alcohol or something, and that will absorb a lot of the oils. So just washing off, um, wearing gloves, taking a shower, cold water. Um, and of course, if you're ever out and about in Northern Virginia, keeping an eye out for ticks. This is really important for our volunteers to be aware of uh, ticks and tick season. You know, ticks are tiny. They like to climb up. Uh, it, I think showering and scrubbing off really well every night before you go to sh bed is really one way to avoid ticks, but doing a tick check uh, is, is really key. So um, I like to use bug spray. I don't like to use deep chemicals, but I did do some research many years ago about geranium essential oil being as effective or more effective than deep. So I like to use that in my mosquito spray. So volunteer management with for our volunteers, you know, we like I said, we have the IMA calendar where days can be posted. Our IMA site leaders have to have a background check because they're working with young people out in the field. Um, and you know, a lot of what I say is, if you're working with others, you know, finding a way to help them enjoy that experience. Whether you know, if they're the type who don't want to get down and dirty and picking up weeds and stuff, a lot of what you can do. Um, uh, is to um, 
have them use iNaturalist or have them use Maiden and log those invasive species. They can be your researcher for you. Take a photo of these. This is how you would do it. Help us collect this information out in the woods. That's one way. Or just saying, you know, I got a group of people. I, there's a range. Maybe there's somebody who wants to use the saw, somebody who wants to use the weed wrench. Others prefer to pull that still grass. And so finding where people feel more comfortable and using and, and using that, using their strengths in that way. Um, and of course, we always say thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for wanting to know about invasive species um, and thank you for the time that you're giving to the park authority. You know, this is again a slide to talk about. Um, this is how our IMA site leaders um, can help with increasing the um, interest in working on an, uh, out in the field with our IMA program. Um, working outdoors a lot. I've heard um, some IMA site leaders have you know, worked with their neighbor, their neighbor's out doing some work, they're out there doing some work and they said, hey, why don't we do this together? And they go out and help out at a, at a local park nearby, uh, which is really cool. So um, here I'm gonna just do some results. You know, here's an image of English ivy pulled away from a tree trunk. Uh, it really does make a difference to give your tree roots a chance to breathe, uh, the bark a chance to breathe and, um, it's amazing when you remove those English ivy roots so many times or Pakistandra roots, you have this native seed bank underground just re ready to come up once it gets some space to grow. Sometimes you don't need to use a native seed mix. So here's an example of the porcelain berry removed from trees, a little bit of before and after. Somewhere in the woods where we've removed the Mile a minute weed from here opened up in a forested area to allow some space for natives to grow. Here's an incredible patch. This is over in Mason District Park. It's just amazing to see the difference now. Um, the invasives are still there. We haven't had volunteers working there as much. So if anybody lives in that region and would like to help out Mason District Park, <laughs> we, are, we are doing a lot still there with our contractor because it is a beautiful park with a lot of high quality forested areas, but it's phenomenal what people can do, what volunteers can do, spending some time little by little, hour by hour, digging out those roots um, and giving natives a chance. Here's a quick slide on some, you know, promoting native species, some of the organizations that I think are either here or you might already know of. Of course, this would be a whole nother PowerPoint to talk about natives and the types of natives that would work. I highly recommend our Sangha's native plant nursery. We get a, we get our seeds from there. Ernst Conservation Seed is our seed source, but I believe also there are other local um, seed organizations. I think Ursanga sometimes does do seeds. I'm not sure how much um, recently, but um, just a lot of um, great opportunity to provide habitat butterflies, birds, you really start to see the difference once you remove your invasives and give the natives a chance. So thanks so much. I'm happy to answer some questions. And then I have a little slide here for just resources. Uh, I'd be happy to share these slides if um, they wanna be posted as well on the website. Excellent. Well, Patricia, thank you so much. There's been a, a lot of chatter on the chat um, area as well. and. And um, and if it's okay, Patricia, may I share your email address um, with folks in case they have additional questions that they may like to follow up with you on, or do you have a preferred email um, yeah. that you would like to share? No, that's fine. I just want to put in the note that I um, because our this increased interest in invasive species management and parkland. I, I have a hard time answering emails really quickly, so just be patient with me. <laughs> I am going through them, but I will respond. <laughs> Just before our program tonight, uh, this morning, Patricia, Harry, and I were talking about how the interest in um, stewardship certainly has made a significant change over the last 10 years or so. Um, and it, not only for folks wanting to remove invasive plants, but also wanting to move forward with planting native plants. And the Plant Nova Native campaign has been an excellent um, effort to to really try to bring forward a lot of the the different um, make natives more visible and um, 
but we still have a ways to go. And I think that there's certainly some some good things that are taking place right now um, uh, at, in terms of legislation and understanding what it's going to take in order to um, make natives the preferred uh, at, at retail establishments. So we're, we're working on that. Um, we do have a number of questions and they're still coming in, which is great. Um, and uh, Patricia, I will run through them. I've been trying to kind of lump them into certain uh, um, categories here. Uh, there's quite a few that are related specifically to um, management of particular species that, that you didn't necessarily cover during your presentation. And so, um, one question, and I really appreciate those who also have experienced probably some of the IMA volunteers mm -hmm. have already been answering some of the questions on your behalf, Patricia. So thank you. Um, I think you may even be just uh, uh, re referencing some of the, the information that they may have already shared. Right. One question that came in is uh, specifically again to your, toward a particular um, species is, do you have any suggestions for controlling liriope and does liriope have invasive tendencies? Yeah, I would say liriope does have invasive tendencies. I've been seeing it in the woods for years. Uh, it, it And digging it out, I think just spending a little bit of time to dig it out um, is the way to manage that. I don't, I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, perhaps some of the IMA site leaders here have, but I think just digging it out, it's a grass, uh, you know, species and does produce berries. Uh, so it spreads that way. It is not one of the worst by any means, but it, it does spread. Thank you. There's a couple of questions that relate to pretty extensive ground covers, Pachysandra, Vinca, or also known as um, uh, periwinkle uh, mm -hmm. and ground ivies. Can, mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit before our program about green mulch, which is basically plants that are used to create a cover and hold the soil in place as an alternative to, to um, shredded mulch and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about what may be good alternatives um, to these very fast growing non-native invasive um, plants that would have a, a native um, can you talk about native alternatives to some of those green mulch? Sure. Options? You know, the two that come to mind really quickly that I love as native alternatives are uh, green and gold. Um, I think it's chrysogonum. Is that right? And then uh, um, uh, ragwort, golden ragwort. Those grow relatively quickly. Uh, and I know there are some perhaps even on this call that might give them away <laughs> to you. But those are some great alternatives. Vinca is just... Um, tough stuff yeah i somebody here is the same advice i dig getting digging it out um periwinkle is just a very thin vine um and it rips on you and so the taking the time to dig it out is great um or, or you know would be the way to go if you are not interested in using herbicide um or have natives that you want to protect throughout that area but i highly recommend yeah i think some even native grass seed spreading in that space you can get some good stuff um that'll grow there uh, but well, uh, golden ragwort's great because and and uh, green and gold because they stay green uh, in the winter as well. Uh, you know, and then ferns are also an alter a great alternative, uh, and and deer, as far as I know, don't like any of these three uh, that I've mentioned. So Christmas fern is one that stays green throughout the winter. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there was. Also, some questions I wanted to just mention, uh, there's a lot of a chatter again going on right now in regards to how to be able to manage Vinca, um, again, also known as periwinkle, cute little plant that has purple flowers. Um, and, uh, you know, there I did include in the chat a link to the wonderful booklet that the IMA program has prepared that has more more species in it than what was presented today and also uh, management um, techniques for some of those too. But there's one species, Patricia, that we we know is really only controlled uh, by panda bears um, <laughs> or that's the only natural real feeder on it. But can you yeah. talk a little bit about bamboo or where, yeah. do, where can we point folks to get a little bit more information about how they can control bamboo? Sure. Bamboo is a tough one for sure. That one is one where you either have to bring in a backhoe and dig out every single root throughout that, you know, system. And those roots are deep and they're dense and they're thick. 
um, or use herbicide. And so uh, information about bamboo, um, you know, the one thing I wanted to say though about bamboo is that we, we at the Park Authority have been receiving an incredible amount of inquiries about bamboo and managing bamboo, bamboo coming from parkland, bamboo coming from homeowner property into all parkland. And we just don't have the funding to be able to manage it because it takes multiple years of control. Bamboo can be managed, but and suppressed or eradicated, but it just takes multiple years. Bamboo um, would require you to, like I said, dig every inch of those root systems about a foot down or 18 inches down sometimes um, and dig those out. And they're very, very tough. It can be done. I've had to plant trees within bamboo roots and <laughs> it's hard, but it can be done. However, so what you want to do is cut it like at around this time of the year, uh, spring, early summer, cut it down. And then when the new uh, leaves come up later on in the summer and in the fall, early fall, that's when you want to apply an herbicide to it, probably around 2.5% glyphosate. Um, I guess stuff that you can buy at Home Depot, the spray, always wear very, you know, protect personal protective equipment when you're using herbicides. I prefer to use a mask even, um, but that's my preference. So if you're using chemicals, but that would be the only way. And then of course you're spraying once after the new growth comes up, again, the following spring, the new growth that comes up, that needs to be resprayed. And then again, most likely the following year. So about three to five years of maintenance, those roots are just so hardy, tough, have so much life in them. It just takes a lot of time um, to maintain, but it's an incredible difference that you make by um, removing this. And then, you know, the stumps of those, uh, the bamboo will become brittle and they will dry up and they'll be easily easy to topple over or remove. Eventually the area will become easier to dig through when those roots are brittle and start to decay. Uh, but that is how we manage bamboo. And like I was saying, we have received so many requests for bamboo. We are collecting a list of or maps of our all the bamboo sites where we re receive these requests because the hope is that our board of supervisors will help us to find more funding for managing bamboo on its own. And so we'll have a prioritization of these bamboo sites that we can get to. But at this moment, unfortunately, um, it, it's just not happening for us, which is, is is a hard pill to swallow because it is all over the place and quickly spreading. So I think I think there's certainly some of that, um, you know, something to leave with folks is those apps that we were talking about, Maiden and iNaturalist, add those locations for bamboo throughout so that we can definitely make sure that um, we're tracking it. Um, it's, it is very, very helpful. And just as, uh, Patricia was saying there, it helps to having that data helps to inform those that are making decisions, particularly related to funding helps them to have better justification for why that's necessary. So, um, certainly. 1 thing about invasive plants, certainly also with my experience is that removing them is absolutely a labor of love. You can't just do it once and then be gone if you do have to come back time and time again. And the best way of, um, you know, avoiding invasives, invasives is through prevention. And that's where a lot of our, our partners like Plant Nova Natives um, and some of the legislation that is, is also taking place to study what the impacts of removing invasive plants from the marketplace might be. If we can prevent them from going in in the first place, then that is um, really tremendous. So something to just kind of think about certainly it's it is a labor of love we all have them um even my property and i and it i do have to go out there time and time again um so let's continue on with some of the questions here there is uh another question last last species here to uh get some information on japanese knotweed Oof. That's sort of like a bamboo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how I see Japanese knotweed, except for it. Uh, I think because where it likes to grow along our riparian zone, um, it is one that we want to prioritize. And I think that, um, you know, and if it's on parkland, letting me know um, where it is so that I can prioritize that site. Uh, but Japanese knotweed, you know, I, that is one where I, you you'd want to attack it with herbicide early in the spring where you have the young growth so you're not it reduces the amount of herbicide you use and also the area that you're spraying um, but that is one that's really hard to dig out 
because it spreads by rhizomes. I imagine if a little bit of rhizome is left, it's going to regrow. I think it's pretty deep, so you're really digging out and disturbing a lot of soil. And most times it's growing on a bank, a stream bank, um, and in a riparian zone where it's really delicate habitat where you could have um, serious erosion problems. And so in those situations, um, you know, herbicide is um, a preferred method. Thank you. Um, Patricia, there was a couple of questions that um, relate to native ground covers or native plants and trying to understand there's certainly natives that have kind of aggressive tendencies um, or, or would be similar in regards to kind of what we might call invasive if they were, were not native. So I think we, we tend to call sort of more invasive natives aggressive um, right. as opposed yeah. to being invasive. But can right, you talk a little right. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, natives actually creating monocultures and what, what the difference is in regards to um, the ecological effects of that? Sure, I'll try. Um, so, I, you, you know, you're right on. It's the invasive indicates something coming from another place, right? So, uh, for instance, Mahonia or Oregon grape comes from the west coast of the United States. Um, it's native there, but it's not native to this area. So that would be in an invasive. It's invaded from another area, whereas our natives like poison ivy can be rather aggressive. Um, an aggressive species, you know, grows rapidly um, and taking advantage of the increased um, CO2 due to climate change. Um, other things I can think of that have that aggressive tendency, though there are native are some of the cultivars. Um, one, uh, you know, Virginia jumps, Virginia knotweed or jump seed. Um, there's a there's a cultivar that has a red flower that has become very, very aggressive um, and really taking over an area, though I think that in some ways because it's been altered, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> now I'm on the now I'm on the fence. Would that be invasive? Um, so I think with like natives that are creating sort of a dense area, uh, like you would see, I think that what you're what you're really trying to determine here is it reducing habitat, is it providing habitat, is it decreasing the space for other natives, um, and has it become so dominating that it is, um, you know, in prohibiting other plants from growing there. You know, that's something to consider um, as well, because most of these natives are creating a space for for, other, for wildlife. Um, they might be aggressive, but we're looking also as the whole of the environment, you know, is it create? This is a conversation I'd love to have with everybody involved here. There's so many great experts in this on this uh, chat today. But, you know, if it's creating a habitat, if it's providing a source in some way and it's a native to an area, there there's there is always something that we need to manage, right? We're, we're, we're taking a look at the ecosystem as a whole. And if the ecosystem has been previously disturbed and you, for instance, like golden ragwort, you know, I, um, I saw Sarah Mayhew was offering some golden ragwort to people who are interested. Golden ragwort can be quite aggressive in a certain area. And I've heard Lisa Bright, you know, mention that golden ragwort really belongs in a certain type of habitat. And so if you have a species that you've introduced or has been introduced to maybe native, but it belongs in a certain habitat and it's in another, it might have those aggressive tendencies. And so I think so much of our land, because we lived in these disturbed areas, all, all have previously been in a construction site, you know, for building your home, we have to consider that and say, okay, well, I'd like to create biodiversity. And so there has to be some sort of maintenance, you know, and this is where I think it's so great that you are all here interested in removing invasive species because so many homeowners, they want to do the native. I want to allow my land to be natural and, and grow as a forested area around my home, which is wonderful, right? Because then you're supporting habitat for wildlife. Uh, however, it's not a no maintenance type of habitat. We still have to be out there, like you're saying, Laura, and taking a look, um, look and see, is that a young burning bush? Oh, is that a young oriental bittersweet? All of a sudden they're randomly growing in your woods and you have to keep an eye out for them. And the little booklets are really great. Also, the um, the Invaders of the Mid-Atlantic, that's another really great book. Um, that's going to be published again soon. Um, so it will be available at the updated edition. I have to admit, I, I do invasive walks around my, my property. Um, and I don't have a, a super large piece of land, certainly, but, but I do walk it. And there is pressure all the time from 
invasive plants, whether it's the Japanese stilt grass, the oriental bittersweet, the honeysuckle, um, uh, youngia, youngia uh, which is another one that is looks a little bit like a dandelion. Um, there was somebody who wrote in yeah. here, eat the weeds. There's a lot of these that you can actually enjoy as well. And um, uh, it always, being a mother myself, it always freaks my kids out when I pick something up and, and eat it. And they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, know what you're eating before you, you do that. <laughs> Make yes. sure you identify it correctly. Um, speaking of pulling, you know, certainly what we're hoping to do today is give folks enough information where you can go and take an invasive walk around your property. Go check the edge, protect the edge of your of any forested area that you have or even as large or small as it might be, because that is going to be the area where you are going to find a tremendous amount of invasives. Um, definitely take a look at, in those areas, but certainly we recognize that it does take a significant amount of effort to go and um, pull them. So, um, Patricia, there was a question about sort of industry, if you will. Do you know of any businesses or contractors that for fee, for example, will identify and remove invasive plants for from private properties? And do you know where they might be able to go and find uh, some of these? Yeah. Um... The um, Invasive Plant Control Inc. is our main contractor who we hire for a lot of our invasive work, and I do know that they also work with homeowners, uh, so that's a great organization or company to work with. There's another company called Sustainable Solutions. Uh, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure that some of the nursery or uh, landscape companies that are on the Plant Nova Native website, they might also, you'd have to ask. Those are two that I know of. Um, the company that used to be Thrive, uh, what are they called now? Um, it's an arborist company. I think they they have also done some work with invasive species, but those are the two sustainable solutions um, and invasive plant control inc are the ones who do are focused on invasive species. There was one that I really liked. They did habitat restoration work. Um, I'm not sure so much about invasive removal, but um, they're called um, Gone Native. They're out of Maryland. So those are a couple of names there for you. It's great. Thank you. Save a tree. Um, Thanks, Claudia. Save a tree is the company. <laughs> They'll remove it. Excellent. Basis. And you can always contact any of the, the local nurseries, uh, landscape uh, professionals that are in the area. Many of them, this, this has been a growing concern, and I know it's been growing in demand in regards to, you know, um, some of their services. So uh, it is not cheap. Certainly to hire folks, but um, they can they can certainly come out and, and assist you with identifying what you have. I actually think that they'll be very excited about that <laughs> to know that you're interested in, in removing invasives. Um, we do like to say, certainly from the conservation side of things, that if you are going and doing a significant poll, please try to bring some of that leaf litter back over. Don't leave your soil completely exposed for long periods of time because that does contribute to erosion, you don't want to create a, a, an all, a different kind of condition for yourself um, that you're going to have to then try to go and fix. Um, so mulch it, add plants as soon as you can if, if that's possible, or bring over some of that leaf litter so that you're creating a situation where the um, soil remain, will remain intact. Um, let's see here. There's a couple of questions actually uh, related to some of the information that you provided that um, folks would like for you to expand upon a little bit. Um, can you, so you mentioned kind of early on about the birds nesting in honeysuckle and that it wouldn't be as successful as if they uh, nested in a native um, plant. Would you expand on that a little bit? Was it, is there a particular reason for, for why that might be the case? So as I understand it, it's because our, the, if they didn't have this sort of cover by these early flat leafing shrubs, they would then nest in an area where perhaps there would be higher up on a tree. Um, and so they're easier for pre for predators to access. Um, and that's really as I as I would see it. Um, that's what Great. I as, as I understand it. Yeah. Yeah, so. that makes a lot of sense. Certainly for. Um, Snakes and other other predators that may may be looking Cats. for a quick snack. Um, so, um, I 
I think that's great, Patricia. There's a number of questions um, and a, a little bit of chatter as well. And how do we encourage retail establishments to um, to promote uh, more invasive? Uh, excuse me, not promote invasive plants. Promote native plants um, and kind of encourage that preference for natives. Uh, can you talk a little bit about perhaps some of the initiatives that are going on right now? And I'd be happy to to back you up there too. Thanks. Yeah, we were just talking about this, weren't we? Yeah, and you know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is homeowners, people going to these nurseries or big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's and just asking, hey, do you have any native species? I'm looking for native species to Virginia uh, and, you know, putting that word out there where they're requesting more and more um, natives. And I think a lot of the nurseries are starting to carry, maybe like Maryfield over the years, they have increased the amount of native species that they're carrying and um, having, which is really great to see. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the, 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 the issue is that our nurserymen know where the money is right they know that in, a lot of people want that plant that can grow anywhere and will spread really quickly uh and that's a big money maker and so um i guess being anti-invasive in that way that it's hard to fight that and because that's where their money is so they're going to provide more of those plants versus others but i think making the request over and over again um the word will get out and and more and we have seen already an impact right that more nurseries have more native species, that there are other orga um, organizations or more nurseries that out there providing more natives. And then more native plant sales too, right? We're seeing more native plant sales uh, because there's that there's that request. That's wonderful. And I actually- Let me give you this answer a little bit. This Thank is you. Harry Glasgow talking. My partner is the Na Nancy Veers, who is the chairman of the Virginia Native Plant Society. And she and the, some other organizations are uh, working very hard to convince the General Assembly that it should take some actions to reduce, if not prohibit, the sale of invasive species. Now, this is gonna be an uphill struggle all the way because as Patricia pointed out, this is, this is a profit and we don't want to, we, we are Americans and we don't want to interfere with anybody else's profit. But this is a, a program that's moving along much faster than it ever has in the past and with some pretty powerful voices behind it uh, and, and sponsors in the, in the House of Delegates. Uh, so uh, there is an effort going on to uh, to make it difficult, if not impossible, for uh, retailers to uh, to get non-native species. And I do hope that we also take a look at it as what the economic impacts are of invasive species um, and what that that contributes in terms of you know some of the challenges to the agricultural community as an example but also to our our landscapes up here in the in the more urban and suburban areas too so that's that's a whole nother component um that i think you know certainly can be contributed uh as well but i'm glad to know you know certainly that there are those that are are working on this and that is a step forward for sure I think Kathy um, question about this too. Um, there is some, do you wanna ask that question, Harry? I'm going back through. I, uh, there's a statement, it's that it's very helpful to show the Board of Supervisors and businesses all the time and hours people are taking to remove all of the invasives and business uh, that businesses sell. So there you go, that, that again is, um, you know, a part of that conversation certainly. Um, uh, as well, the Plant Nova Natives website, which I'll add a link to here in the chat box, has a long list of different native plant sales that are taking place this spring. The Prince William Wildflower Society, which is the plant sale that um, Nancy is currently at, that Harry was just referencing, is taking place this morning. Um, but again, I will will provide that information in the chat box, uh, the, the link to the Plant of a Native site so you can see all the different plant sales that are taking place um, uh, currently, which I think is great. Um, I think, let me go back to my list of questions here. 
Um, I saw one I'm, that I can quickly respond. One question was, um, can you expand on how natives, especially Virginia creeper, don't damage trees the way English ivy does, having an argument with a neighbor? Um, so I think what I like to say is that in native species uh, like English or like winter creeper um, will grow with, they coexist with our trees. They have these little tendrils and they just grip onto a little branch and then they grow up with the natives. They don't um, mat out the, tr the tree bark like English ivy does. It's a it's a fine vine along the ground. The leaves are high off the ground, so the moisture isn't held down like it does like with English ivy or pachysandra. Um, and so it, it's it's um, a lot more delicate growing. It doesn't have that weight like our not like non-native species do. Um, and so it doesn't weigh down our native trees. It grows up with them. I hope that helps. That's great. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I've added the the link to Plant Nova Natives. And um, again, if these are the, this is certainly some information that you can take into your backyard the moment we end today's uh, webinar in order to um, you know take a look and see what you can do in regards to your stewardship, your personal stewardship um, on your property. And if you do have other interests in being engaged. The links to the IMA calendar are in the chat as well. Uh, you can Google IMA calendar or FCPA invasives, um, and you'll certainly get taken straight to uh, their website, it, which is which is really really great. Um, please be engaged. Please be informed. Please use a lot of these tools. We've been all working extremely hard to pull together these tools so that. Um, while the park authority and other conservation groups are doing the work on and being good stewards of the lands that they manage, translating all of those different tools and resources and information and getting it into the hands of the residents so that they can take it forward and uh, continue with the good stewardship of their properties and make informed decisions is something that we're all working very hard to do. So with that, Patricia, there's a, some comments about Deer management in regards to, you know, um, forest health conditions as well. And that is possibly another program and presentation that we may bring um, to the green breakfast. So please stay tuned on that. And we hope to get Katie Edwards out here at some point in order to um, to share some of the insights on why that is so important and what what we are all doing. Um, Patricia. Do you want to have the last word in regards to what can folks do today? Sure. In their, yeah. In their Thank backyards. you. Yeah. So again, thanks so much for your interest. Thanks for the the care. Um, and you know what I do want to say is just be careful because it's you have to take time to learn the difference with the natives and the non-natives, right? And so use the app, use the iNaturalist app, Google it, there's Google Lens, just, you know, look up the species and making sure that you're seeing what you're seeing out there. Um, and, you know, so many times we have to use two different types of eyes. This is something I learned with birding, right? We have to look for um, the landscape to see if we spot the movement, and then we have to look down in the detail to see about what species we're looking at. And so similarly, when you're walking around in your yard or on the woods, you're looking at the landscape to see are you seeing that abundance of habitat or the monocultures or like the dense growth of of an invasive species and then look closely at the detail to see that make sure that you're seeing those little hairs on that multiflora rose so being careful so that you know so that you don't pull in the unnative species i guess is what i wanted to say so grateful that you're interested in removing invasives but we also want to protect the natives so taking the time to to research ask the question um you know uh, post it up on a Perhaps the plant, the natives um, listserv or something like that too, and asking, "Am I looking at the right thing?" So that's what I want to say. So thank you all for your care and what you're doing out there, um, and happy to help. Excellent. Get out there. It is so cathartic to rip out native invasive <laughs> plants and go and, and plant some natives. I'll tell you what. After a hard day of work, um, there's nothing I enjoy more than ripping out some, you know, uh, Oriental bittersweet and finding them. <laughs> Um, there is something very sure. satisfying once you do go through your property and you train your eye to identify certain species. You will see them all the time. It will change your view of the forest. Um, so be prepared for that. It's okay. We, <laughs> and if we're all working together, we can make a difference and we can make an impact, certainly. 
Um, today's you. webinar, again, we really appreciate everybody sticking around with us. We had almost 80 participants, which is really fantastic. Patricia, you engaged 80 additional IMA volunteers. So um, that's really, really exciting. You're armed with a lot of great information. Patricia's email address is in the chat. I hope you won't hesitate to follow up with her um, for, for any questions that you might have. We will be posting today's webinar, a video of our webinar on uh, the Facebook page uh, for the Soil and Water Conservation District, as well as um, it will be posted to YouTube. So if you just simply Google Soil and Water Conservation District YouTube or NVSWCD YouTube, you'll be able to, to go directly to it. Uh, we'll also have it on our website uh, shortly. Um, but again, please don't hesitate to, to give us a call, use all these tools, and um, we look forward to continuing you know, to support your stewardship. And we thank you very much for caring so much. Have a wonderful Mother's Day and celebrating all the moms out there and uh, go out and enjoy this fantastic day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you all. Yep.